many of us have either fond memories of science class or nightmares of experiments gone wrong? Today's science class students have an edge thanks to our program that pairs teachers with research scientists. Dr. Kelly explains that meditation may be the cure for whatever ails you. And C. Adrian Murphy introduces us to an artist with a unique philosophy on the sculptures he creates. All this tonight on Catholic Magazine. With your window on your world, this is Catholic Magazine. Good evening again, everyone. I'm Paul Perillo. Good evening, and I'm Pat Shelton. Thanks for joining us again this week. On our program tonight, C. Adrian Murphy is with us, and she'll have her next installment of Legacy. You may want to set your VCRs, especially for our checkup feature. Dr. Kelly's presentation is something you may want to replay more and more. But first, on our program tonight, believe it or not, at one time I, yes I, contemplated a career in the sciences. I can only wish that there was a program around like the one we're about to see. Project Labs, learning about basic science. Do formulas like H2O, C6, H12O6, NaCl, C8, H18, plus 12 and a half, O2, equal 8, CO2, plus 9, H2O, plus energy, bring back horror stories of science experiments you'd rather forget? Do you still experience panic attacks when you see boiling water or hear the phrase scientific method? Well, times have changed, and fortunately, that dreaded hour of science class is dreaded no longer, thanks to a cooperative effort between a leading specialty chemical manufacturer and science teachers from the Philadelphia area. Learning about basic science, or Project Labs, as it is affectionately known, is a program which pairs senior research scientists from the Roman Haas Corporation with science teachers from across the Delaware Valley. Initiated in 1989, Project Labs is an effort by Roman Haas to increase not only a teacher's knowledge of science, but also to demonstrate its importance in today's society. Labs means learning about basic science. And what we try to do is to show the teacher that the science they are teaching is relevant to the products which Roman Haas makes, products which are used in the paint that goes on the wall, the polish that goes on the floor, uh, the insecticides that are used, and so forth. Dr. Frederick Owens, a former research scientist and current administrator for Project Labs, formulated the idea for the program following a workshop held at Roman Haas for local teachers. The concept for Project Labs came from holding meetings for teachers and then finding out that what the teachers wanted were lessons they could take back to the classroom to show the students the practicality of the science that they're using. Project Labs is designed to give teachers a one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on, non-textbook approach to learning, which offers the teachers an opportunity to experience science in a whole new way. Participating in labs at Roman Highs was a very, very enlightening experience for me. Uh, being a science teacher doesn't mean that I've spent any time in a science lab. So this gave me the opportunity to work in a lab. I was unaware of safety precautions when I first came in. I was unaware of how sophisticated the laboratory equipment has become because I've been teaching for, I'm back in the classroom about 13 years now, but I started teaching 25 years ago. Number one, I think the biggest benefit they get and what the teachers frequently tell us is just being in a laboratory and talking to scientists who are actually doing work in the area. They get a much better appreciation for the fact that the scientific method which they teach is being used every day by scientists. Devised to create practical experiments that can be used on an elementary or secondary school level, Lab's purpose is not only to assist teachers in becoming better educators, but also to help them turn students on to science. The purpose of the program is to help teachers 
better educate our students in science, to show them that science is all around them, that they use it every day. Once chosen for the program, the teachers are paired with a research scientist from Roman Haas and spend one week at the facility developing their experiments. Although a large majority of the teachers bring their ideas into the program, the final results are a joint effort between the teachers and scientists. Generally, the teachers have some idea of what they want to do when they come to Roman Haas, and they're very enthusiastic. The scientists also have ideas as, as to how those projects can be implemented, and after sitting and talking and discussing the projects with the teachers, usually some kind of common agreement is reached. The difficulty that we always find as the scientists is that the things we want to do are not always applicable to a schoolroom, whereas the teachers have a much better idea of the kinds of things they're able to handle under s classroom situations. Utilizing everyday consumer products, the scientists and teachers help not only to keep the cost of experiments low, but also to demonstrate to students that whether they realize it or not, science is all around them. The type of experiments that are conducted are simple and safe experiments that teach the scientific method and experiments that can easily be repeated in the classroom. The children should come away learning about the, the principles of science involved and should benefit by being able to put their hands on something that, that they can use in biology, chemistry, or physics. By creating an industrial partnership between Chestnut Hill College and Roman Haas, Project Labs became eligible for partial funding by the National Science Foundation, an arm of the federal government designed to increase interest and education in science throughout the country. The National Science Foundation had uh, the opportunity for an industrial uh, partnership with academics, and so we wrote a grant. And so Chesnell College has a $151,000 grant to take the projects that are developed and do the teaching to other teachers. And then the participants themselves, if they choose, can also get some graduate credit for their, for their involvement in it. About now, you're probably asking yourself, why would a large corporation like Roman Haas be so concerned about what happens in today's classrooms? We are a scientific company. We rely on science for our products. We need scientists in the future, but we also need a scientifically literate public. And the more that the, the students in school learn about science, the better citizens they will be, and that benefits Roman Haas and the country. Roman Haas is involved for several reasons. The primary one is somewhat selfish in that we realize we need scientists for the future of the company, and we're hopefully educating a task force for the future. Since its inception, the popularity of Project Labs has grown. The program is so successful that last year alone, over 100 teachers applied for only 18 available positions. What makes Project Labs so appealing is that teachers have the opportunity to disseminate the knowledge they have gained to other teachers through presentations given during Delaware Valley Science Week. But in the long run, the people who benefit the most from a program such as this are not the scientists or the teachers, but the students. Students who no longer have to dread the prospect of another science class, but instead can welcome it, thanks to a little experiment called Project Labs. And now, C. Adrian Murphy visits Anthony Visco, a truly gifted artist who shares his gift of art with us through things like Stations of the Cross. Welcome to Legacy. I'm C. Adrian Murphy in the studio of artist Anthony Visco. When I was an art student, I was fascinated by the Stations of the Cross in my church, Old St. Joseph's. The unusual composition and the tension, the pathos, and the intense spirituality of the figures really made me wonder about the artist who had designed and executed them. So we came here to meet Tony and introduce him to you. Hi, Tony. Hi, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. We had a fascinating discussion about 
the use of the figure to find the incarnation and how we use the physical to find the spiritual. And you had passionate feelings on the subject. Yes, I do. Uh, it's very important to me. Since um, the physical comes from the spiritual, since it's, it's from the Godhead, it, it's, it's our point of tangency, it's our springboard back to the spiritual. You said a fascinating thing about how quality honors creation. It mimics creation because since all creation comes from God uh, and we are made in the image of likeness of God, it, it serves God to imitate his creation as much as we possibly can. I think one of the things that happened during the Vatican II period was that we confused quality and novelty. Uh, for most of religious art history, um, the newness always came from the quality. As we found our new sense of spirituality, we found a new, qu new quality in which to represent it. In modernism, we find that quality only comes from newness, new techniques, new styles, new patterns, new designs, uh, without much narration or thought behind it, or without a discovery of our spirituality first, and then find the way to, to manifest it, hoping that it will come through the newly discovered material. Well, in addition to using the figure to express this, there's an awful lot of symbolism in your work as well, and we talked a little bit about the labyrinth. Oh, yeah. Um, essentially, it, it becomes symbol, but however, it's, it's, um, it's actually part of creation too. It's not just the, the uh, human figure or the, um, the carnate, but also the visible and invisible. So something like geometry comes into play as as God's creation also. We see it all through nature, the uh, harmonic proportions of growth systems, and um, it gets picked up in art. Then we assign certain symbols to it. For example, the labyrinth, uh, one of the old symbols of, of odyssey or, or, or transitus, that one must enter the labyrinth in order to exit the labyrinth. Uh, I'm using it for the um, um, commission of, of St. Joe's University, and Christ receives his cross, he enters the labyrinth. So therefore, we also follow the, uh, the passion through Christ's labyrinth. What's been wonderful for me is to have the opportunity to do the Stations of the Cross twice, once for old St. Joseph's and now for St. Joseph's University. Um, the first was, was absolutely wonderful because I discovered so many things about not only myself but, of course, the Passion of Christ. When I was given the commission for the second time, um, I realized that, again, I could reintroduce things that were important to me and things that I would find again within the Passion of Christ. Um, one of the things is the use of, of both negative and positive reversal and um, not depicting everything in rational space and in rational time. And to bring it more into a, a mystical realm of the intangible. In the panel depicting Simon assisting Christ carrying his cross, I have Christ in the negative supporting Simon carrying Christ's cross. Tony, where do you see sign and symbol in religious art taking us in the future? Well, since they're part of creation and part of our historical past, they are part of our future and part of our now. It simply depends on how well we use them, if we choose to use them, whether or not we use them. They are there. They will always be there. For eternity. Yes, for eternity. And we've seen how spiritual inspiration manifests itself in the physical creation of art meant to inspire the spiritual. Thanks for joining us, and please join us next time. And now I understand sculptors always have a bottle of red wine in the studio. Always. always. After work. And starting May 23rd, the public will be invited to see Anthony's recently installed Stations of the Cross at St. Joseph's University Chapel. Now, I wonder how Anthony relaxes. Are you one of those people who just can't seem to relax? Well, Dr. John Kelly is here next with Checkup, and he has a prescription for us. It's a prescription for meditation, not medication. How would you like to decrease anxiety, 
lower your blood pressure, cure headache, insomnia, even boost your immune system, all without medication. How? With meditation. Meditation is simply the process of quieting one's mind. You see, we all possess an innate ability to enter a deep, relaxed state, one in which both physical and mental processes are slowed down. With practice, one can readily attain this state, and if you combine this with faith and prayer, immeasurable benefits emotionally, physically, and spiritually may result. In his book, Beyond the Relaxation Response, Dr. Herbert Benson outlines the necessary steps for effective meditation. First, find a quiet environment, one to which you can readily retreat. Secondly, choose a spiritual word or phrase, seven words or less, which you strongly identify. Examples may include Hail Mary, full of grace, or come Holy Spirit, or simply the word peace. Next, assume a comfortable position, but not too comfortable for fear you may fall asleep. Gently and easily close your eyes, and then begin to relax each muscle. Start with your feet, contract them, for four to five seconds, and then release, and proceed upwards, your thighs, your chest, your shoulders. Make sure your neck is loose. Your arms should rest comfortably in your lap. Once you've achieved this position, focus on your breathing and the word or phrase you've chosen. Inhale lightly and gently, and with each exhalation, repeat the word or phrase that you've chosen. It's very important to assume a passive attitude. Intrusive thoughts and other distractions are bound to occur, but these happen to everyone. If you pay less attention to these distractions, they'll lose their power. Don't fight them. Just gently slip back to your breathing and your focus. And don't worry about how you're doing. Just proceed to your breathing in a matter-of-fact manner. Do this for 10 to 20 minutes, and at the end of that time, keep your eyes closed for a minute or two, and gradually and slowly resume your everyday state. Try this twice a day, preferably on an empty stomach. In a few short weeks, you'll notice you're more calm, less anxious. You'll see less stress-related symptoms such as backache, headache, or high blood pressure. More importantly, you begin to usher God back into your life. You see, by quieting your mind, you'll more readily sense God's presence and discern His love for you just as you are. You'll feel more worthy, more secure, more at ease. You see, resting in God's love, a love you don't have to earn, a love that is yours just from being, is the most direct path to inner peace. As the psalmist has spoken, be still and know that I am God. For Checkup, I'm Dr. John Kelly. I hope you're feeling very relaxed now because I have to warn you that some of the footage in our next feature on, on Alzheimer's disease is very graphic. It's sad to watch someone we love sink into Alzheimer's, but it's best to know as much as we can about it. It's so bad you don't know what you're going to do. It's real hard to 
see them go down like that when you know how they were before. There is a killer among us. It is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is one of the more common causes of a deterioration of memory and intellectual function in elderly people. It affects their memory as well as their language, visual spatial functions, and the general ability to cope with novel situations. As the disease progresses, life diminishes. The victim becomes bed-bound and vulnerable to infections. Usually some kind of infection is the final complication of the illness and becomes the most immediate cause of death. But in actuality, that's the result of the deterioration from the Alzheimer's disease itself. The cause of Alzheimer's is believed to be genetic. However, there is a theory that exposure to certain elements in our environment can be a factor. Between one and three million elderly people in the United States have Alzheimer's. There is no cure and there is very little hope. Like but Alzheimer's is in for a fight, and B. Gorman throws a good punch. And all these people knew what I was going through, and I knew what they were going through. And there was a bond between these people that I had never known in my life. We all had something in common, and we all wanted to do something about this terrible <coughs> disease. And there were a lot of tears that night, and there were people from Texas and from all over the United States. I think I came the farthest but I would have gone to Timbuktu to find out something about Alzheimer's disease. Five members of B's family have been struck with Alzheimer's. Her mother, brothers Herschel and Leonard, and sister Minnie Sue have all died from the disease. Another sister, Norma, is in the last stages of Alzheimer's. After Minnie Sue died from Alzheimer's, I was getting very panicky. I was scared. I was depressed. I felt very guilty that I was going to get this disease and pass it on down to my children. And uh, I just felt like getting in the car one day and driving off the cliff. And instead of driving off the cliff, I ended up in our church. Bee's faith in God brought her through. In 1981, she founded the Alzheimer's Aid Society of Northern California for family members whose loved ones have Alzheimer's. The disease is as hard on the family, if not harder, than on the victim. If you live with an Alzheimer's person, it's like living with, my brother-in-law put it this way, living with somebody that has a zero IQ, an adult, an adult that their diapers have to be changed, an adult that you have to feed, a 210-pound man that you have to clothe. It's a 24-hour day job. It's like taking care of a two or three-year-old, but they're an adult. We think my mother has Alzheimer's and have since found out that we believe her sister has Alzheimer's also. Um, this is the first meeting we've been to. You want to pass? At Alzheimer's Aid Society meetings, families share experiences and care for each other. She called the police on me and was so angry at me. She called the union hall, accused my brother of raping her. It was, I mean, I said my mom's losing her mind before I had her. We had this CAT scan when she was diagnosed. But now we're at a stage where she depends on me more, and it's like she'll look at me and she'll say, I love you, and she says, you'll never know how much I love you, and thank you so much for helping me. I was telling her about this rare disease in our family. I had no idea there were two points. For the Alzheimer's disease family, strength and courage. For those who seek the cause, cure, prevention, and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, your guidance and direction. For the hope you have given us, our thanks. Amen. Frida and Leroy Bowles. Leroy has Alzheimer's. His brother, a sister, father, and grandfather all had the disease. Five years ago is when I noticed it. You know, because we were on a trip. And he kept getting confused and didn't know where he was at. And up until that time, I didn't know. You just have to go along with it. There's nothing you can do. And there's no cure. Mm -hmm. The doctor says he don't really know he's home. 
half the time you don't know me. The Sutter Oaks Alzheimer's Center in Sacramento, California, provides care for 162 Alzheimer's victims. B. Gorman visits here regularly. Tell me about the church you started here. You remember that? Hmm? Can you remember that? No. No? This is a place of comfort and safety for Alzheimer's victims, a place of sadness for family members. A place that reminds B. Gorman the problem is not over, and the fight must continue. May is National Foster Parents Month. Thanks to all foster parents from Catholic Social Services. Foster families are special individuals who, pro who provide safe and loving homes for two children who cannot live with their biological parents. Foster parents are single or married adults ages 21 through 60 who want to share their home, love, and parenting skills with a child. To learn more about foster parenting, contact your local diocesan Catholic Social Service office. St. Casimir's Parish in Riverside, New Jersey will hold its annual Memorial Week Carnival beginning Memorial Day, May 31st, and ending Saturday, June 5th. The carnival will take place on the school grounds each evening from 6 until 11 with a special Kids Day on Thursday, June 3rd. For more information, call St. Casimir's Rectory at 609-461-0532. Until next week, I'm Paul Perello. And I'm Pat Shelton. Good night. Good night, everybody. Sep materials for Catholic Magazine provided by Tague Lumber Incorporated, serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years and by John Wanamaker, fine stores in the Delaware Valley. Legacy with C. Adrian Murphy is brought to you through the courtesy of the Joseph Grayton Institute at Old St. Joseph's National Shrine. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Catholic Magazine, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842.